On Tech News Today, the UK spy agency tracked WikiLeaks users, Bitcoin ATMs coming to America, and why you may soon give Samsung the finger. All that and more coming up next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's Tuesday, February 18th, 2014, and this is Tech News Today. This episode is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter TNT. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT2. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin. And I'm Jason Howell. Tech News Today explores the most important stories of the day in conversation with the world's leading journalists. Our guest today is Joe Panateri. Joe is editorial director for the Varguy MPS NSP Mentor and Talk in Cloud. Did I miss any? I know you're involved in a lot of stuff. You have your hands in a lot of cookie jars, but I, did I miss any major ones? Yeah, so you mentioned the channel ones, but uh, we have some sister sites over at Penton Technology Group, such as Win Super Site, Windows IT Pro. While I don't uh, uh, get involved in those hour to hour, I am managing them day to day. So uh, it's good to be involved. Well, somebody's got to do it, and I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, for those of uh, you watching, Joe and I uh, go way back. We worked together many years ago, and uh, he's an awesome dude, and I'm glad he's here. So th uh, welcome, Joe. Thanks. Let's get right into the news. New revelations from the Edward Snowden documents published on The Intercept today reveal that the U.S. and U.K. governments targeted WikiLeaks and other activist groups, as well as visitors to WikiLeaks. Documents from the U.K.'s Government Communications Headquarters, or GCHQ, reveal the real-time harvesting of user IP addresses and the collection of search terms used on other sites, such as Google Search. And once again, Joe, uh, PowerPoint. These guys were, like so many of these revelations, <laughs> came to us from internal PowerPoint documents where they were essentially bragging to each other about what they were capable of doing. It's, it's astonishing. Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, one of my first editors in the industry once told me the lesson that software never dies. And apparently you can add PowerPoint to that list of software that'll never die in terms of sharing this information. You know, and, and as I heard about it, um, I, I started to think about the irony in all this in that, you know, I think in recent months you've heard uh, the international community, this outcry about NSA spy, uh, spying. And uh, you look at British companies in particular, all worried about what's going on with, with the NSA potentially spying across the globe. <laughs> it's almost like the story has, has flip-flopped now where, where the British agency, the uh, GCHQ, is now involved or has been involved. And you almost wonder, are U.S. companies now concerned about this? Particularly, you know, I, I think we've all heard from the Googles and the Microsofts and the Facebooks of the world. But what about thousands of small businesses that still want to get online, that still want to go to the cloud? Should they be worried about this so it seems like we're getting new red flags all over the place here and, that, and that's a great point i mean uh gchq data showed that in fact they did track americans uh and this contradicts and it's like big outrage but the the point the reason this is interesting is that they claim that they have a deal between the u.s and the uk where they won't track each other's citizens and this essentially looks like a, uh, a red flag that they, in fact, did that. This reminds me of the hack we talked about uh, by the Canadian agency that was tracking people in airport over airport Wi-Fi. They were also tracking people within Canada, also leaving Canada and continue to track them as they were in the United States. So it's kind of an interesting thing. One of my favorite uh, aspects of all of these revelations are the goofy code names that they come up with and this one you're going to hear it a lot uh, it's called anti-crisis girl that's the name of this code name for tracking wikileaks and wikileaks and its users and of course uh just just uh, i'm sure everybody under knows that wikileaks is the nonprofit organization that publishes leaked documents the one that was founded by julian assange and uh, so this is a really 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 interesting uh, uh, turn of, uh, of, of affairs that shows the GCHQ again bragging. Uh, they used publicly available analytics software called Piwik. Piwik. Yes. Is that how you it, say it, that? Piwik. I, I believe it is. And, and what I find interesting about that, Mike, is is 
It seems like every hack case out there lately has involved publicly available tools, whether they're open source or corporately available tools. Um, so, so there's these cases, but then if you look at uh, like the Target hack, for instance, that involved uh, commercial remote monitoring and management software that corporate IT departments use. So I don't think there's a lot of quote unquote custom written software being used here for, for all this monitoring and spying. It's almost like people are taking off the shelf tools and applying them for questionable uses that uh, you know increasingly upset the public. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening. And by the way, this uh, particular story came from The Intercept, as I mentioned earlier. The Intercept is actually a new website dedicated to revelations from the Snowden pa papers. It's a really great resource for this type of information. So, uh, yeah, that's so, a so you almost wonder if the NSA <laughs> <laughs> right. and uh, GCHQ are, are now monitoring that site with those publicly available tools. That, that's the beauty of all this. It's making everybody paranoid. And I think that the degree to which people are now paranoid is about right. I mean, mm -hmm. finally, people, people are worried. They should be worried because everybody's hacking everybody. Uh, and, uh, and it's something that uh, you basically have to protect yourself or you will be hacked. Uh, that's pretty much the world uh, we're getting to. Well, we're going to talk about uh, the new, uh, new uh, information in the world of Bitcoin. But first, I want to tell you about ShareFile. I told you a minute ago, you got to protect yourself. And ShareFile is one fantastic way to protect yourself. We talk a lot about security. Well, one of the things that people do very often that isn't secure at all is they s simply attach their files to email messages and they send them out over the open internet. And it's a very insecure way to, to share files. A much better way, the best way to share files is to use ShareFile. In ShareFile, you can use, uh, you can send uh, spreadsheets, uh, presentations, uh, contracts, any sort of uh, document that uh, you want to be safe and secure, and you share it over email, but you don't actually share the file. You share a link to a secure website where your file sits safe and sound. Now, uh, of course, when people uh, open this file, you'll be notified that they opened it, who opened it, when it was opened, and that gives you an enormous peace of mind because you know that after they've opened it, then you can take action, such as contacting them, following up, or going in and deleting the file. There's so many uh, powerful ways to use ShareFile. It's just amazing. One of the great things about ShareFile is that it'll enable you to send files of almost any size, enormous files, gigabytes in size. You can send very easily on ShareFile, and it, it's just as easy as sharing a small file. Now, some people uh, use ShareFile only for those really big files or only for uh, uh, files that they really, really want to be secure. But it's a good idea to use ShareFile for all your file sharing. It's simply a convenient an easy way to share files. And uh, the more you use it, the more secure your stuff will be and, uh, and the more peace of mind you'll have because you'll always know who's accessing the files that you send and when. Now, ShareFile syncs automatically, so you and your team will always have the most updated materials instead of having multiple copies of files flying around, which is always a bad idea. So I want you to try ShareFile today. We have a special offer for you. If you sign up today and and receive a 30-day free trial with no obligation, go to sharefile.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and enter TNT. And remember, visit sharefile.com and type in TNT. Well, Bitcoin ATMs are coming to the United States at last. The company that makes the ATMs, called RoboCoin, said today that Bitcoin kiosks will be installed in Seattle and Austin. With us to talk about this is Phil Waba, retail and consumer correspondent for Reuters. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. Now, this is uh, not the new, the first time that uh, Bitcoin ATMs or kiosks have been installed around the world. They're just the first time in the U.S. I believe the first one was in Vancouver, Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, it was uh, uh, opened in October. Okay, and how is that going for the company that makes this? Uh, are it, do they well, consider this a successful uh, operation so far? Um, you know, it's a good test market. In fact, uh, they, they like what they see in Canada, despite the fact that uh, the Canadian government doesn't recognize, recognize Bitcoin as a currency. They're planning to um, to uh, install a, an ATM in Calgary uh, um, also in February. Now, how does this differ from a conventional ATM? Well, it's, you know, the, the one of the biggest things is it, it's sort of bulky like an ATM, but there's a scanner to read government-issued identification, uh, typically driver's license or pass. Uh, passport so that it can confirm a user's identity. And then that will allow people to put in Bitcoin uh, for cash, redeem it, or deposit cash and buy 
more bitcoins um, uh, and transferring funds to or from a virtual wallet uh, on their smartphone. So it's not exactly like an, an, an ATM, but it's, it's the same concept. And what's the advantage of having something like this in a public space as opposed to just uh, processing Bitcoin the, the, the normal way? Well, you know, it's it's uh, it's physical. It allows them to use physical cash. But I think the reason uh, a lot of people have taken note of this is that uh, it's just another step uh, and a pretty big one into the mainstream for uh, the, this new digital currency. I mean, uh, you know, two ATMs in a country of the size is not really a big deal. But uh, if it's the beginning of, of an outlay of ATMs, then, then that really signals that this is going mainstream. I'm curious about where these things are typically installed. I mean, the the one in Vancouver and there are a couple of, in Europe. I believe one is going up in uh, in China somewhere. Are they at are they at stadiums, or, uh, malls? Where where do they typically install these well, things? Well, the, the the one in Vancouver was installed in a coffee shop, and uh, the reason they chose Seattle and Austin, I was told yesterday by a spokeswoman, is that those uh, those two cities are considered to be you know avant garde and a bit more adventurous and. Uh, they just thought that they would make uh, good fits. Um, you know, it's a large country, and but but those two cities are seen as tech hubs and places where people are a bit more um, uh, adventurous. And they drink a lot of coffee, especially in Seattle. So this company, yeah. Robocoin, is based in Las Vegas, as I understand it. Are they planning to put this into casinos and have a sort of gambling? Will you soon be able to gamble with Bitcoin, as if using Bitcoin isn't already a little bit of a gamble? <laughs> uh, well... It's funny you say that because, uh, you know, the, the Bitcoin, yeah, when I last checked, was around 636. In September, it was 150. In December, it was at $1,000. So, you know, uh, it, it, it certainly fluctuates more than a currency. And, and so I guess, it, you know, it is a bit risky like gambling. But it's, it's not, it's not going to be for casinos. They just have to be based in Las Vegas. Uh, they haven't really laid out their uh, or any way expressed their plans for the rest of the U.S., but they are planning to start installing some ATMs in Asia and Europe. And I think the idea is, is just to, to sort of plant this idea in people's minds. Um, and then and then roll them out further uh, based on how people react to them. Well, thank you for joining us today to talk about this. This is a really interesting development. Thank you very much. You can find Phil Waba at on Twitter at Phil Waba. So it, that's spelled P H I L W A H B A. Well, Samsung's flagship Galaxy S5 smartphone will have a fingerprint sensor built in after all. It'll be built into the home button, similar to the Apple iPhone 5S, according to a new report. Now, we had heard all kinds of rumors, the strongest of which had been up until today, that the fingerprint reader would exist on the screen, that it would be maybe even have no buttons on the whole phone, but it looks like there can be conventional buttons and it'll have a conventional a fingerprint reader similar to the iPhone 5S with one exception. The iPhone 5S allows you to just put your finger on the button and it scans it, whereas with the Samsung, uh, as we're hearing from the site Sam Mobile, you'll have to swipe your finger. It'll be a, a smaller uh, button that you'll have to swipe your finger across. Joe, do you think this is going to usher in the combination of both Apple's flagship phone and Samsung's flagship phone, usher in uh, fingerprint identification as the standard for smartphones? You know, we've been watching it closely. One of the things I'm, I'm quite interested in is the uptake between this and then something like Knox, which is Samsung's um, more corporate enterprise security platform. So as, as consumers in increasingly adopt this type of technology, can you then get potentially single sign-on to all of your uh, SaaS applications, cloud applications? Can your corporate IT department begin to track you more easily as you're using this these fingerprint-type devices? That's what we're watching closely. You know, maybe we re starting to get near that tipping point. I'm not quite sure we're there yet. Well, it's really interesting because we heard originally that Samsung was looking at retina or eye scanning technology for, for login. Um, you know, I imagine that eventually many phones will have multiple t types of login. And of course, you can do these things with apps uh, right now. But whatever a company like Samsung builds in as the default is likely to have a lot more uh, users and have uh, go a lot further in making it become a standard. Now, according to what we understand uh, from the report, uh, you can register up to eight fingerprints and you can assign each fingerprint a different task. So this is something that's kind of like a macro or sort of shortcut where you, if you use this finger, it means open the browser. If you use that finger and you know, you can choose which fingers tell what to whom, of course. And there, there also may be uh, uh, the ability to log into websites 
to replace your password uh, using this directly. So instead of entering a password, you simply swipe your finger and in you go. Uh, we're also hearing that uh, the phone will have a personal phone folder and a private mode. So there'll be a whole like secret encrypted uh, section of the phone where you can keep your private documents that can only be accessed uh, with the fingerprint reader, even after you've logged into the device itself. So that's uh, kind of an interesting uh, development. Well, Google has acquired the Israeli startup Slick Login. Uh, it replaces passwords with sound-based authentication. It's kind of like two-step authentication, but with sound. Uh, the way it works is that a supporting site sent, you know, a site that supports this technology sends an, uh, an encrypted code via ultrasonic sound to smartphones. So you can't really hear it. Uh, it's using a uh, sound above the frequency that humans can hear for the most part. And this transmits the code to a phone. The phone transmits it up to the server and authenticates it. And again, it's like two-step authentication. I really like this idea, Joe, because uh, um, if you look at, uh, we just talked about Samsung's fingerprint reader. Of course, Apple has a fingerprint reader. Mm -hmm. If you authenticate the phone itself, then this kind of thing coming to a phone and then coming from an authentic, authenticated phone, of course, Slick Login's technology doesn't necessarily require uh, fingerprint login, but that's biometric ID combined with something that's like two-step authentication, and that's pretty good authentication. And the other thing I like about this is because it's sound, because it just works over regular speakers and microphones uh, using the devices people already have, it's easy to understand, and if it's easy to use and easy to understand, people are likely to use it. Uh, yeah, I agree. You know, it's, you know what it reminds me of, to, to put it in sort of a consumer context, is when you get in your car and you your car automatically discovers your smartphone through Bluetooth. Reminds me a little bit of that in terms of putting it in really simple terms. The other thing that I really thought of as I heard about this potential deal or this deal going forward is machine-to-machine um, -machine communications. This whole idea that, uh, you know, until now, we've bo mostly done things manually uh, interacting with the devices, but increasingly it's going to be a machine-to-machine -machine communication or the Internet of Things communicating with, with each other and, and hopefully taking human error out of the conversation. Yeah. And another uh, app that uses sound in a kind of similar way is called Chirp. Now, Chirp is essentially a technology with an API, and the company wants people to use their, their sound encryption technology. Uh, but they also have an app that lets you send over, you know, audible range, pictures, links, uh, notes, and things like that. And we could, uh, I've even thought about using it for this show. For example, if I played a Chirp sound and you had the Chirp app, you would actually get the website or the note or the picture or whatever it is that I'm sending just through the speakers, just through the speakers of the show itself. And so that's an interesting uh, application for broadcast media where you can essentially broadcast. It's like, a, it's like a QR code that's based in sound or something like that. It's pretty right. cool technology. And again, I like sound technology uh, because it's, it's short range for the most part. And uh, when it's done the way that Slick Login is done, there's also a GPS, there's a location uh, element to it that helps uh, with the security. So if you say that you're in Tel Aviv, where this company is based, and your uh, confirmation code comes from a phone that is in Tel Aviv, then that's better than a phone that's in Eastern Europe or something like that, when you just told them that you were, weren't there. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool technology. And again, Google bought it, which means that they're probably going to build this in at least as an option somewhere. And I think it's a, I think it's a great um, uh, company. I saw their demo at Tech at TechCrunch, and, uh, and it's a really, really good uh, uh, purchase, I think, by Google. And probably didn't cost them very much because they have neither a product. Uh, they've only been around a couple of months, and so this probably uh, cost them almost nothing. It's mostly an aqua hire. Well, Apple may have thought about buying Tesla. That's right, Tesla, the electric. Uh, car company. Uh, a new report in the San Francisco Chronicle says Apple mergers and acquisitions chief Adrian Perica met with Te Tesla CEO Elon Musk last st spring. Joining us to talk about this is Thomas Lee, the business editor and columnist with the San Francisco Chronicle, who broke the story. Thanks for joining us, Thomas. Thanks. So um, from what I understand uh, from your story, uh, you have a source that says that Apple's um, uh, mergers and acquisitions chief met with Tesla. Does that necessarily mean that Apple might have been interested in acquiring Tesla? I think it strongly suggests that Apple was interested in uh, buying Tesla. Uh, whether anything actually came out of it, it's uh, it remains to be seen. I mean, this meeting is important to remember. It took place in uh, last 
uh, May, I believe. And uh, for Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, to be at Cupertino headquarters meeting with Apple's top m and guy, I mean, you can do the math on that one. But what was said, said what was done, was there an actual date? Uh, I can't really say. Also, there have hasn't been an acquisition since then, but at least up until that point, there was uh, at least a fairly serious high level discussion between the two companies. And if you remember around that time, uh, there was already chatter about Apple possibly acquiring Tesla. So uh, the fact that this meeting even took place is pretty intriguing. Now Tesla's market, Tesla's market capitalization is about $25 billion, as I understand. So that's pretty much Apple lunch money. They could easily do this from a financial point of view. The question is um, whether they would want to. And, you know, this is obviously a radically different business on the one hand. On the other hand, this was actually Steve Jobs' dream project. Uh, there's multiple reports that, that suggest that uh, former, uh, the late uh, Apple CEO Steve Jobs wanted very badly to eventually launch an Apple iCar, as people call it, an Apple automobile. And um, so maybe, you know, maybe the company is trying to fulfill that dream in some way, or maybe has long term plans for a car. Do you think that they'll still be looking around for some kind of uh, uh, some kind of involvement in the car industry? I would think so. I mean, I think you make the good point that this was Steve Jobs' uh, you know, dream before he passed away. But honestly, uh, unlike, you know, something like the iPad or iPhone, he never got to see the fruition that dream. So this could be just as much as a big deal for Tim Cook, his successor, as it is for Jobs in the sense that maybe Tim Cook be, can be the one that actually sees this through into a product area that's completely different from uh, what Apple is doing now. And I also tend to think that Apple needs to grow into new markets. And, you know, the market for consumer electronics is, it's, uh, you know, starts off fast and it matures pretty fast. So, um, you know, people might think this is kind of a crazy deal, but in the sense that uh, Apple has the money and they certainly have the vision and I think they certainly have the need to do something like this. So whether it's Tesla or something else down the road, I wouldn't uh, completely rule it out. You know, I can't help but think of the uh, the, the smartwatch and, and wearable computing aqua hires that are taking place across the industry, including by Apple, where they're actually going after the kind of people who would work at Tesla. Uh, I can't help but think that maybe one of the things they might have been pondering is if they could not buy the entire company, but maybe just buy their R&D part of their R&D company that does batteries. Because battery technology is something that uh, companies are like Apple, who are trying to have wearable computers, are really interested in, and the, the expertise seems to be focused on these electric uh, car companies like Tesla. I can imagine Apple acquiring the, the, the group that does batteries and licensing that back to Tesla while learning from the, and expanding it, and, and, and learning from what they do in terms of uh, battery and, uh, and power management and so on. Do you think there's any possibility that they might have been looking at, at, at just purchasing part of Tesla? I, at this point, I think that uh, they could have been doing anything. I think that we tend to think of these deals as, the, you know, they either acquire it at all or don't do anything at all. Or we think of Apple getting into cars or medical devices or they don't. I think that the thing that we've learned about Apple that they tend to take a very broad look at everything in terms of the ecosystem of products and the services they want to get into. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that they could have been... Uh, um, not just an outright acquisition they're interested in, but in terms of town or specific technology. But I think the important thing is to think about is not to think in silos like cars or metal is that the whole idea is what can they do to integrate all these things into the broader Apple universe and provide a whole portfolio, a portfolio of technology solutions to, to different types of industries. I also wonder what, whether the uh, whether the conversations stopped with the uh, mergers and acqu acquisitions people, uh, because you know you don't if you're so interested in a company that you talk to them and think about like an acquisition, you don't just say okay, well if we can't do the acquisition, then we don't want anything to do with you. I mean, uh, Elon Musk has said that he's t moving the dashboard, the 17-inch screen that's on the dashboard of Tesla's, to Android. So I can't h help but think mm -hmm. that Apple may have. Uh, uh, have different ideas for what kind of uh, operating system they could have on that screen. And so I wonder if, you know, okay, we can't make a deal, but here are, here's our iOS and the car people. Maybe you can talk to them for a while. Uh, 
it'll be interesting to see. And at the very least, you can imagine Tesla having an option between iOS and Android uh, on the screens because, of course, their customers are, are likely to have one or the other. So uh, anyway, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting story, and and I thank you for breaking it. Uh, it was uh, interesting reading. I was telling Joe uh, on the break that um, that uh, I wrote an article a year ago, exactly one year, February sixteenth uh, to the day, uh, saying that Apple should buy Tesla, and I gave all these reasons why they should buy it. And then one year later, you came out saying that they, in fact, uh, did talk to them at, at the very least. Anyway, thank you for joining us, uh, Thomas. I really appreciate uh, your article and your insights on all this. I appreciate being on your show. Thank you. Thanks. You can find Thomas on Twitter at by Tom Lee. That's B-Y-T-O-M-L-E-E. -E. Well, King Digital Entertainment, the UK-based publisher behind Candy Crush, has filed for an IPO. Uh, boy, this is a time to do it, isn't it, Joe? I mean, these, these guys are flying high right now, and it seems kind of unlikely if you look at the history of other companies like this that they're going to be flying this high uh, this time next year. Yeah, the, the numbers are absolutely unbelievable. I mean, just to, uh, to to double check my notes here, I think they're approaching two billion in revenues, approaching six hundred million in annual profits, um, and I think that's up from roughly two years ago of, at about uh, six hundred and fifty million in revenues, uh, and uh, well, six twenty in revenues and uh, sixty four million in profit. So the numbers have been skyrocketing. But you know, these waves seem to be they build bigger, they build faster, but then they crash even faster. You you know, I, I, I have flashbacks every once in a while, Mike, to our childhood. And you think about things like Atari, where it was a decade-long march, um, and then ColecoVision after that, Nintendo, et cetera. Now the waves tend to be one or two years. And, and um, for better or for worse, very often it's all tied to one game, one hit. You almost wonder if this company is going to be a one-hit wonder. Um, so, so I'd be a little wary uh, myself in terms of investing in this one. But, uh, but boy, the numbers over the past year have been unbelievable. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, it'd be great if, the, you know, they can knock out hit after hit, but that's just not the history of this category, uh, especially these mega hits like Candy Crush. They want to trade under the New York Stock Exchange, by the way, under the uh, title King, K-A-N-G. I can't believe nobody else uh, snapped that one up. That's a that's a great uh, uh, code for for the the stock exchange and uh, also a little trivia point candy crush is the second highest grossing app on apple's app store uh, as of tuesday behind clash of clans so that's a really uh, a super successful app and they made their money uh, by essentially getting people to uh, level up and, um, and and pay up after they've gotten the free app. Well, the Wall Street Journal reports today that Iran's breach of a Navy computer network was far more extensive than previously thought. The Journal reported uh, the hack back in September, and at the time the Navy said that the intruders had been shut out of the site. But now we've learned that they uh, hung around and continued to infiltrate the system until November. Now, this seems to be a trend, uh, Joe, where uh, foreign adversaries are hacking non-classified sites, essentially public websites, that are that that interface with uh, personnel, with military mm -hmm. personnel. And so, this in this case, hackers uh, targeted the unclassified Navy Marine Corps. Essentially, it's an intranet, but it's a it's their all-purpose internet site for benefits and all kinds of things. And uh, but this was a, a persistent hack, and it was apparently a pretty successful one. Yeah, you know, and I think as you look at this case and you look at some of the others we've been discussing in recent weeks, is uh, the common thread is technology is the great equalizer at this point. You don't have to be a quote unquote rich nation, powerful nation to use some off the shelf tools and start to get information uh, hacking these various sites. Uh, you don't need to build a quote unquote weapon of mass destruction when, when your new weapon of choice happens to be IT. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really fascinating that you'd think a superpower like the United States would be able to essentially uh, clean a site like that more quickly than a few months. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's a defensive capability that's lacking in addition to an offensive capability that's present uh, by these off-the-shelf uh, hacking tools that you, that you mentioned. And so, uh, you know, it's after Stuxnet, uh, Stuxnet I guess uh, they felt that the U.S. had it coming. And, uh, you know, not a big surprise that they wanted to, to do this hack, but kind of surprising at how successful they were at it. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that one. Well, I want to tell you about my favorite site for building websites called Squarespace. Squarespace is a beautiful site that lets you make beautiful websites uh, that will turn your business into a superstar on the Internet. 
Uh, if you go online, if you have a website for any reason, whether it's a professional website where you're selling uh, products or it's your personal website, uh, no matter what you do online, people will judge you and your company based on the quality of your site. What makes a quality site? Well, started, it starts out with aesthetics. Uh, so many uh, websites online are ugly, uh, they, they're noisy, they're hard to navigate. With That's impossible on Squarespace because you start with 25 beautiful templates. These are really, really nicely designed uh, templates. And then you go in there and you can modify them using their simple tools so that your site is unique even as it continues to be very beautifully designed because you started with that beautiful template. Uh, Squarespace has recently added something really cool. It's called a logo creator tool. And if you have a small business and you want to create a logo, you can go and you can spend a fortune hiring a designer and get something you may not like so much because somebody else may have a different vision. Or you can go in and build it yourself using uh, their simple tools that start with some all kinds of basic shapes, which you can combine, you can change the colors, you can change the size, you can change the configuration, and you'll end up with a, with a logo that's completely unique and that you can use on your site and that you designed yourself. It's really kind of an amazing uh, tool, and it reminds me of the Squarespace site itself. They basically have brilliant designers, and then they give you the tool the tools to make you come looking like a, a brilliant designer uh, yourself. So uh, you if you want to check out this uh, logo creator tool, by the way, you can go to blog.squarespace.com and check that out. It's a very, very powerful tool. Plus, uh, Squarespace now has a completely redesigned customer help site for easier access to self-help articles and video workshops. They also have e-commerce. So if you want to sell something uh, online, you want to start your own business, or you have an existing business you want to sell over the Internet, Squarespace will give you all the tools you need. And this is available for all subscription plan levels, by the way. This isn't some super expensive thing that's, uh, that, that's going to cost you a fortune. Squarespace starts, in fact, at only $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Squarespace is famously mobile-ready. Their, their new Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad lets you check site stats like page views, unique visitors, and social media follows. And with their blog app, you can make text updates, tap and drag images to change layouts, and monitor comments on the go. So start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to s sign up with Squarespace, make sure you use the offer code TNT2. That'll get you 10% off, and it'll also show your support for Tech News Today. We thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. And remember that a better web awaits, and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Well, the robots defeated humans in jeopardy. And now they want to take us on in ping pong. The Shanghai robot maker KUKA plans to take on the German table, teb, ten, table tennis player Timo Boll in a match scheduled for March 11th. The robot is a manufacturing robot built for factory work, so no matter how well it turns out in the upcoming match, you can be sure it won't be ping pong players this robot will be replacing. Well, that's our show. Uh, I want to invite you to send your news tips to our email address at tnt at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW and leave a message. Also, post and upvote your favorite stories on our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com and find the rest of our social pages by searching for Tech News Today on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to Tech News Today at twit.tv slash TNT. And make sure you turn, tune in to our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, which is at 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, thank you, Joe, so much for uh, joining us today and, uh, and being uh, our uh, co-anchor here. Hey, Mike, always great to talk. Thanks for having me along. All right, and thank you for joining us, and we'll see you all tomorrow.